Ladies and gentlemen, hunters and huntresses, this is the Boots and Backstraps podcast. Come on now. On his own, looking for backstraps, way deep in the woods. Tracking in a swamp to a hayfield under the harvest moon. When the tags are filled, it's time to switch up our boots. Head down to the honky tonk, get us a swing dance or two. We're talking about boots and backstraps. This is the show where we talk all things hunting and country music. From the classics through today, from big bucks to bull elk, we've got it all. Welcome to Boots and Backstraps, everyone. I'm your host, Shane Michael, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host and country music legend, Tomcat. Come on now. How are we doing, TK? I'm doing wonderful. Good to see you, Shane. Me too. Episode one. I'm excited, boy. I tell you, I like to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, we're here today. And uh, I don't know. I don't think you're nervous, are you? No. Nah. We've done a lot of crazy stuff in our lives. We, we both have stood on stages in front of tens of thousands of people and told jokes and kept the party going. This is pretty laid back. Yeah. And you forgot to add quite often making idiots out of ourselves. That's that's <laughs> part of the protocol when you're an MC for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So for folks that don't know, what are we doing with this whole thing? Yeah. Well, we're here uh, to have fun. Uh, most of the people you know and most of the people that I know like country music mm-hmm. and uh and most of them are hunters. Right. Two of our favorite topics. I know it's two of your favorite topics, and certainly two of my favorite topics. Topics. <laughs> Taco Tuesday, Tom. <laughs> yeah, Taco Tuesday. Um, I love hunting and I love country music. So here we are, and we thought we'd uh, share some of our insight. We certainly have a lot of friends and acquaintances in the hunting industry, and in the country music industry, and. We're going to bring country music celebrities to our show. Right. We're going to bring hunting celebrities. Personalities. Celebrities. Personalities, yep. Yeah. And uh, we've got some very, very colorful personalities coming up. When I think of some of them, I just laugh. Right. The, the Elk Whisperer is going to be with us. Yeah, excited about that. Um, I am excited because he's really nervous about it. But, you know, it's just sitting around uh, having a beer and talking hunting and country music which we all love we're missing something though tom yeah don't you you feel like we are i think i'm gonna let you go ahead with that i was just gonna say it wouldn't be right for you and i in sitting down having a conversation like this if we didn't have whiskey involved right i'm telling you you know i used to think i invented drinking (laughs) 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 i couldn't believe that i found out that it was it's been around long before i ever joined the earth but during the rowdy cowboy show for uh, 35 years we certainly partook in uh, a fair amount. A fair amount. I think we there. kept uh, Jack Daniels in business Thank for you, about Joe. a decade. I'm I'm thinking so. <laughs> oh, and Coors Light. And speaking of Jack Daniels, look at our selection for the day here, TK. What do we got? Looks to me like a Jack Daniels uh, single barrel. Yeah, Jack Daniels single barrel. It's uh, one of my personal favorites. To our inaugural show. To our inaugural show and our friendship. And sorry. our friendship and our, 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 our new and old hunting uh, stories that we're going to share with you and to all the great guests we're going to have on here. By the way, we have a great one today, and we'll talk about him in just a minute. But Get some here's to all of you. Right. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I hate that. It's as good as I remember it. <laughs> it's been so long. Speaking of guests, and TK, you, uh, you absolutely nailed it. We could not have started this thing off better than who we've got in studio for our first guest today. You know, we, we talked about, or you talked about the fact that we're talking about country music and we're talking about hunting and that kind of thing. And we have a guest that is at the top of the food chain for both sides of this conversation. (laughs) So I'm super excited to have uh, in studio with us today or for us to have in studio. But before I get to that, I want to just give a quick shout out to our team because this is the first episode and we'll have some credits, but I think it's really important because we've worked so hard to get this thing off the ground to give them some credit where credit's due. Yep. So first and foremost, uh, we just saw Jill in here. She's our studio manager. So she's kind of keeping everybody happy and making sure the guests are doing what they're supposed to be doing and getting stuff turned in on time, all that kind of thing. So yep. Jill Franco and uh, our producer, the queen bee, the one that's really in charge, the one wearing the, the boss pants for this whole thing, Danny geo productions, Danny George. 
And then, of course, our statistician, the guy that's on the fly back there with the computer and contributing to make sure that we remember throughout the episodes that not everyone listening will know exactly what we're talking about. Because sometimes we've got people that are listening in, <laughs> in the video format, which we have. And we've got some, uh, you know, people that are on iTunes or Google Play, things like that, that are the audio version only. So we got Killer Kyle back there. On the and mic. the people that know us best know that quite often we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. And we never claim to be real professionals, do we? We're winging we, it, for sure. We just, uh, we like to have fun, that's for sure. And uh, our friends know that. And uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce our guest this this afternoon. Speaking of singing, uh, singing, speaking of seeing or experiencing a thing or two, this guy uh, is an absolute rock star. So the owner of minnesotacountry.com and a founder and co-board member of the Minnesota Country Music, or sorry, Midwest Country Music Organization. Let's uh, welcome his studio, Ryan Pilgrim. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Ryan, we're, nice we're pumped to have you, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I forgot today. Yeah, he's not alone though. You're, no, I'm not getting off the hook. I forgot boots too in my rush to get out the door this morning. But Ryan, man, we're we're on on absolutely honored to have you here, man. The the fact that you have been such an avid hunter for so long, and the fact that you are so tied into not just the local country music scene but the national country music scene so we're super pumped to have you yeah well first off thanks for the invite i appreciate it um when you called me the other day and asked if i'd be interested he thought me, i was gonna try and sell him soap <laughs> it, it, it took me about um about 0.3 seconds to decide on uh whether or not i want to be a part of the first episode and it was a hundred percent yes so <laughs> yeah um I, I appreciate that and this place that you you guys aren't aren't messing around. As soon as I walked in, I I saw that um, you're definitely set up for a a real pro production, and uh, this this place is pretty badass. So thank you very much for yeah for having me on. I appreciate it. You know, I when I saw your truck pulling, and I thought I said to my wife Lynn, I said, I think Burt Reynolds is pulling in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, must be Burt Reynolds or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even though he's passed, uh, God rest his soul. Not yeah. really that bright but <laughs> no he's he's good it's good ryan tell us about your organization well no we're, we're gonna start off with some hunting stuff tk okay let's let's do it yeah we have a lot probably to say about the music side yeah okay so maybe we'll start with the with the hunting stuff and uh you know I, everyone in the local scene obviously knows about you and music and that kind of thing but maybe i mean some people obviously know you hunt but maybe not as many people know that you hunt so why don't we start with sure. you telling us about how you got interested in hunting and like that kind of how that got into your life, how you got started with it. Yeah. Well, I've been around hunting literally since I've, since I've been born. Um, my dad's a taxidermist. We won't ask you how old you are. We don't do that. <laughs> how old well, are you? 39. Ah, there he goes. <laughs> He's half your age, TK. <laughs> Damn near. <laughs> so, so I've been around hunting my, my entire life. Like I said, my, my dad's a taxidermist. Um, he and his, his brothers grew up hunting, so they've been around it their entire life. So, you know, it was one of those things that, um, was always prevalent, I guess is the, is the right word to say, uh, when I, when I was growing up. Like and, you didn't have a choice. You're going to be a hunter. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> hunting and fishing, right. Is fishing right. all summer. And then when from, you know, September to, to December, it was all, all hunting. And then it, switch over to fishing for, for ice fishing after, uh, after December, and then roll into fishing in the spring and then start hunting again in the, in the fall. Um, and you know, I've, I, I don't know if I want to say how young I was when I got my first gun, but it was single digits. Um, you know, when I had my first 22 and we'd go out squirrel hunting, yeah. uh, my dad would take, take us out squirrel hunting and, um, get started with that and then have you hold on a second now have you eaten squirrel though oh yeah a bunch of times oh and it good yeah it actually is it's really it's super good. tender yep. delicious yeah. yeah my nephew um you know kind of grew up the same way that my brother and i did so same thing started started out hunting squirrels and the rule always is if you if you shoot something you got to eat it yep right exactly and, it's and, a good rule and so uh you know we he loved hunting squirrels and so we would eat squirrels for you know, a couple meals in the fall because he liked hunting. So, and as long as he would eat them too, um, you know, that again, the rule is if, if you're going to shoot something, you got to eat it. So that, that's kind of how I started. And then when, when we were kids, you know, the, the hunting age was 12, right now, yep. now it's 10. And I know in some of the Southern States, you see kids that are six or seven shooting deer, but for, right. for us, it was 12. And 
you know, couldn't wait to hit that 12th birthday. So that next fall that you, that you were hunting, um, and and get your red rider. <laughs> yeah. And the, the red rider BB gun. And so that's, that's where my, my first big game stuff came in. Um, my, the first deer I actually shot was, uh, a mule deer doe out in Montana. Wow. Um, we have a, a ranch that we hunt on and I, I've been going out there since I, you know, again, since I was in single digits, um, my dad met. Is it like friends of your family then? So my dad and uh, his brother were up elk hunting in, in the mountains in Montana and met, there, there was an older gentleman who was um, camping up there by himself and he had, it, it was, the weather wasn't great and he was struggling a little bit. So they stopped to help him. Okay. Just to be nice to help a, a fellow hunter. Yeah. Right? And it turned out that... Um, uh, Herb was the guy's name. His brother, Willie owns a ranch out in Montana and it's tens of thousands of acres. Wow. And, um, it's a wonderful story. I yeah. That. So we got the invite or my, my dad, uh, got the invite to, um, uh, to hunt antelope and mule deer on that ranch. And so we've been going out there ever since so I've been going out to Montana since, you know, the, the early nineties. Um, and that's Willie's ranch is where I shot my, my first deer. We back in that, um, in those days, you could get two B tags. They're called, you know, yeah, their B right. tags, where it's the doe only. So we went out there and um, I shot two does that trip, and then that was in the middle of October. And I can't even, I can't do the math, so I don't know what year it was, but <laughs> it's a long time ago. Where about some Montana? Where are you? Uh, Malta, Montana. Okay. So it's it's northwest of the Fort Peck Reservoir. Sure. Um, which is the the biggest this um, guy's got a Rand mcnally yeah. in his head just so you know <laughs> it, it, oh absolutely i know exactly where you're talking about yep. and it, it, there's good animal hunting and decent mule deer hunting south yep. of the reservoir and and kind of around the reservoir there charles um, russell wilderness yeah yep. yep there's good elk hunting there too oh yeah they have some giants out there got one really <laughs> yeah, the problem <laughs> with with not, not to shift gears because yeah. you know this isn't like an elk specific topic but we um we talk all the time about the how tags have gotten out, outrageous, ridiculous, mm, especially Stupid. for Montana yeah, as a non-resident. Twelve hundred bucks now, or yeah, right, it's for just... non-resident. And you, for those folks that are listening or watching this podcast, that's the cost of purchasing the license, which you need to hunt that animal in that state. And if you don't have success in your hunt, you don't kill the animal. They're not giving your money back. So you, that's what uh, we hunters call eating tag soup, right? Right. Yeah, and that that's just to play the game. You right. know, that yeah. doesn't get you out there. Right. Gas, lodging, everything else. Equipment. <laughs> yes. You have some money in equipment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way, way too much to count. Right, um, right. But going back to what I was saying about my, uh, my my first year hunting, I think it was in, it must have been 94, okay. I, I think, the fall of 94. And um, so I shot my two mule deer does, and obviously that was, I was really excited about that, and then got to hunt my first fall in Minnesota. And um didn't see anything the first day it's, when you were hunting uh for your uh to your meal meal deer hunt was yep. that archery or was it rifle rifle okay and i actually used a, a ruger mini 14 so like wow. the first the first assault rifle assault assault rifle. yeah <laughs> rifle if you will that's yeah uh, sure that's what i shot my um my first first year with was that's a 223 the ruger mini 14 223 yep yeah and i don't know if we still have that gun or not but um it was, an, it was a nice little gun. Yeah. And then. And you had success with it, sounds like? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. One Nothing shot. Nothing like Montana. Time. Oh, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's unfortunate that it's gotten to be. You know, I, I used to emcee the grand opening of uh, some Cabela stores. Yep. And I would meet a lot of people at the door. Long story, but met a gentleman from uh, Montana. And I just. Go ahead. Go long story. I'm going to have a little more Jack Daniels. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear Just this. being neighborly. I said, boy, someday I'd like to live in that state. And, you know, truer words were never spoken. He looked at me. Yeah, you and everybody else. So you could tell. One of the reasons their tags are so high is the locals just hate the influx of people. They move to Montana or they live in Montana because they like the isolation and uh, not so isolated anymore. Hey, right. Kyle, can you real quick just pull up what the – we got Killer Kyle on the old Google machine in there. What is a non-resident – Elk tag, elk tag in Montana for 2021. Be curious to know what that is, what we're talking about. But go ahead, Tom. I don't remember what I was talking about. No, I'm you're saying Jack you're, Daniels. You're saying that <laughs> that the locals don't like the influx. Yeah, they really don't. And you know, uh, 
Idaho, Montana, Utah, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, you know, they're, they've got this massive, massive influx of people from California. Right. I know Coeur d'Alene, I have family in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and 30 years ago, there was a huge influx of people from California, and that hasn't slowed down a bit. And you watch the, if you, if any of our viewers have seen the, the series Yellowstone with Kevin Costner. Great show. It's a, uh, most of the city stuff is uh, filmed out of Bozeman. And we ran into a local coming out of Montana on our bear hunt this last fall. And he was telling us that like anyone that's from Montana calls Bozeman, Boz Angeles now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, it's crazy. You know, it's, I, I've seen bumper stickers. Uh, if you're from LA, leave your politics at home. <laughs> well, th that's the big thing, right? There's yeah. when, pe when people move in and then the <laughs> Montana folks and same with Texas now too, right? It's, right. You, Texas and Montana, they have their, their set ways and have no issues with people moving in, but trying to change their don't, politics don't, and yeah, their way of life. Don't bring your, your, not to get into politics, but don't bring your, your, politics with you you know yeah that's, yeah that's what makes these states great hey this shane they are yeah what do we got uh looking at this and it's showing effective march 20 uh march 1st 2020 so they're not showing anything for 2021 at this point yeah, but license fee all, yeah. one thousand eighty nine dollars fifty cents <laughs> i guess i was a little over i knew it was about eleven hundred dollars yeah. that's still can you believe that like and and as i said before you don't get it back if you don't have success yeah. right and it's not guaranteed success that's a mortgage payment for some people. Well, yeah, you say it's not guaranteed success. Success rates very low. Yeah, for elk hunting, for public land especially. Yeah, you know, ten percent, thirty percent, or something. Oh no, it's not even that high. It used to be thirty percent. I don't know what it is now. It might be ten percent statewide or something like well, that. I, I think the bull success rate is lower than the cow success. Oh rate. right. So yeah, if, yeah, you, good point. if you bring everything in together, I think it's probably around thirty percent still. But I think the bull success rate is around between 10 and 15. Or yeah, 15, they're getting smarter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I understand, uh, Shane and Ryan, you know, it's really, really expensive. There's pros and cons of it. If you look at it from the DNR point of view, they're getting cuts from the government. They need to make money to sustain what they're doing. I get that. Plus, they're actually kind of trying to discourage a lot of non-residents to come to their state because the residents don't like all of us hunters coming there. So if they get the price up, well, then they're happy to get that money. Uh, but what about the, and we can talk about this, what about the fact that everyone's trying to get hunter retention or trying to get young kids into hunting? Well, with the license fees gone right through the roof everywhere, I think Minnesota is one of the best at not jacking it up to great heights, and Wisconsin's not bad. But so many states have got their prices so high. How, how does a young guy that's maybe going to college or maybe just out of high school, how does he afford, you know, an $1,100 ticket to go to Montana? and Guy out? or gal. Guy, guy or, or gal. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Guys or the Producer women. Danny with a quick catch. That's right. Yeah, hunters it's, hunters it, and huntresses. It's tough. You almost, you know, at that age, um, I, I think it's, one of two things, right? You either have to stick to your home state, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. the New Mexico. Which is tough if you like elk meat in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. For, for example, the New Mexico non-resident elk tag, I think is $875 oh. for the mature bull. Um, the the resident tag, I think is $75. Right. Which is, right. I mean, that that's how it should be for the resident side. Absolutely. I think, I think they jack up the, uh, the non-resident, like, you know, as you're saying, but it's, you either have to have parents that will take you out there. Yep. And that can afford it mm -hmm. um and or, or stick to your your home state and the unfortunate part now with with tags as expensive as they are a lot of middle class families i mean you can't afford to could you imagine three elk tags no no i mean that's 30 thirty three hundred dollars right for i have three Montana. sons yeah. so i'm doing this math yeah <laughs> and every fall oh yeah i mean between I mean, my three boys and me I'm at four grand plus in tags alone. Yeah, and that that's not including gear, like you were saying, mm -hmm. or getting out there. I mean, that's at, at the end of the day, just to just a hunt for for three of you would be five or six grand after you factor in fuel and food. Yeah, it's a tough deal, food. boy. They want young people to get more into hunting, and I think one of our saving graces, um, 
Well, first of all, and I think any hunter out there will agree with me, uh, and I am not the sharpest tack in the box, but women uh, joining the leagues of uh, hunters is a huge deal. Oh, yeah. Because the anti-hunters have a tough time picking on the mother of uh, somebody's children. When she's trying uh, to, like, fill her freezer to feed her family. Absolutely. Right? Uh, women in hunting and uh, the trap leagues in the high schools these days, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, all the trap leagues are so successful, and that's typically and can be one of the first steps into a young person in high school getting involved in whether it's duck hunting, pheasant hunting, grouse hunting, uh, whatever it is, goose hunting. And uh, those are great, great deals. But uh, these prices on the tags, getting back to that, it's tough. It's impossible for right. the mass kids, the mass of youth, to get involved with hunting with the prices so high for licenses. So they need the money, the DNRs, they need the money. They want young people to get involved with hunting. It's a catch twenty two. I don't know how I don't know what the solution is, quite frankly. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Yeah. The other challenge is that if you're you look at how you get around or or what the the direction that that expensive tag takes you in is you either are looking for private land, right? Like yep. you guys have. Yep. So that you have a greater chance of success. Or you're doing kind of, you know, what the group that I'm with is doing and you're training harder before the hunt to go further into the mountains or the woods or whatever, than the lay hunter will be willing to go to have a better chance. Well, and that's a hundred percent the way it is for elk hunting for us, whether it's in Montana or, or New Mexico, it is, um, you know, you're, you're walking further than, than anybody else yeah. because that's, that's how you get to the areas where they're not going to be other hunters. And even we, we hunt every year for whitetail down in Kansas, archery hunt. Nice. And, and we hunt state land down there and it's walk in only. And we, you know, walk in a mile or more um each way <laughs> yeah. just to get to our stands. And that's um again so that we can try to get to a spot where you're not gonna have other hunters walking in on you. Sometimes you do, which everybody has the right to to hunt any state land. Um I'm completely fine with that. Well um, Bivy's gotten popular more lately, the yep. Bivy pack hunting. Yep, yep. And so it's like you're saying, it's getting ready and, and training and allowing yourself to walk those, those distances. Um, cause then when you get an animal back there, you got to get them out. <laughs> hey Shane. Yeah. You got an extra 50 to 75 pounds on your back trying to come back out. Shane question for you. Yeah. You said bivy pack. What is that? So the, there's a few different philosophies, right? Right. When it comes to hunting, yep. you got sort of like your base camp hunter where you have a, a tent or you've got a, even some people use like an RV or a camper yep. and you're coming back to that same spot every night. And then you've got this sort of modern version of the kind of stock and go bivy pack where this bivy pack is a small version of a tent. that's almost like a sleeping bag. That's got a, a, a sort of like canopy attached to it. Yep. And so you're literally just packing that on your back. So you're going out in the mountains a few miles and you're hunting in that area. It starts to get dark. You stop literally in that spot. You find a good spot to kind of set up and you take this bivy pack, which is again, just like a giant sleeping bag with a canopy attached to it, to create kind of a little personalized tent. And you, you stay the night there, have your food and stuff there. And then the next morning you get up and you repeat the process. Yeah. It's, it, that's exactly way, the, a good way to explain it. It's everybody has a base camp and then some, sometimes you'll just, go as far as you can and it allows you to get out further from base camp yeah every, every day um, cast your net a little further yeah exactly because you got to go where the, the animals are right yep they don't just walk up to you ryan i wish <laughs> <laughs> it'd be nice if it was that easy right especially the giants right 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 seven <laughs> by seven yeah where you at <laughs> like a 400 class bull time just comes walking up to you yeah and then you're shaking like not like a leaf. lifetime yeah, so i got on the screen there a uh, few examples of those baby packs you were talking about yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. So you get, for the folks that are on um, one of the audio-only platforms, Kyle pulled up some photos here off the little Google machine, and it shows exactly what we're talking about, where you got that sort of sleeping bag with a canopy attached to it. So it's really just a one-person tent, essentially, but it's attached to the sleeping bag just for the sake of making it easier for setup, tear down, and carrying out. And if you can't afford one of those, you can do what I used to do, is you put a blue tarp in your backpack and a rope. Yep. And you string the rope from tree to tree, and you make a little tent, and <laughs> he'd be right next to warm. Davy. He'd be right next to Davy Crockett. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Davy, your hat's in the way. <laughs> Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Well, the so te- the technology is pretty cool these days. It yeah. is. It's it's amazing. And and really it speaks to what we're talking about when you have these outrageous prices for stuff. You got to figure out better ways to get to the animals and have better success. Well, and kind of what what Tom was mentioning earlier um about more and more women getting into the um into hunting, which is great, and shooting sports, whether it's yeah, hunting or just just shooting. Um when you mentioned the trap shooting in high schools they didn't have that when we were around no right. i wish they did because that's awesome that, oh, that yeah, kids get to, get to do that but i know what i would excel in <laughs> yeah right but <laughs> we the, can't talk about that on the show this is pg-13 time <laughs> <laughs> the higher end hunting um companies are making gear specific uh to women so first light that's that's what i wear uh, those that's, guys are that, great that's all the all my hunting stuff is first light and they allow you the technology, you know, it's all merino wool. So you can bring two two changes of clothes and make it out three or four days, which is fine. I mean, that's merino wool is unbelievable. The, the shirt that I'm wearing right now is merino wool. Really? Yeah. It, 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 uh, it, it's moisture wicking. It's better than Under Armour and the synthetic stuff, and it doesn't smell. It's, and I've, I've tested oh. it out. Um, when yeah, we, yeah, clearly. When we were in Montana, I was just say you don't smell right now, yeah, bro. Right. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah, right. Like, can we make this couch yeah. bigger? <laughs> but I, I had never heard of it until a couple of years ago. Um, I bought all, I bought five sets of Under Armour, uh, lowers and uppers, um, yeah. base layer, or, or bottoms and uppers. And um, my uncle was up and hunting, and he said that he has first light. And I said, "What's that?" And he told me about it. And yeah. luckily, I'd only opened one of the one of my Under Armour sets. So I, I took four of them back and then I bought two sets of, of first light and as and a test run kind of thing. Yeah. And, Cause you really only need to like for, for Under Armour, that stuff smells so bad after you wear it. Yes. You, you it have does. to, you have to I change agree. it out. But, but uh Merino wool doesn't. And I tested it out in Montana. We were animal hunting. We were in the, out there in the middle of October and it was 70 degrees when we were out there. And I wore the same shirt four days in a row and that's sweating. So you're thinking I'm going to be funky. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't smell at all. It was crazy. Wow. And after that I go, okay, yep, this stuff is legit. And I, I just wanted to test it out just to see if it would actually, you know, hold water to, um, to what they say it does. And yeah, it was, I, after that I was hundred percent sold. And how was first light, you know, cause I don't own any first light. How are they priced comparatively to some of the other big brands? So, like so, Sitka is kind of like the most expensive, right? First Light and Sitka are very similar. Okay. First Light, Sitka, Kuyu. Kuyu, those, yeah. Those three are, I mean, uh, a base layer shirt at First Light is 80 bucks. A short sleeve shirt. Long sleeve shirt is 100 bucks. Oh, for base layer. Yeah, and that's just the lightweight stuff. Yeah. And when you were talking about how many, how much money I have in gear, I, I have more than just You the, need a calculator. <laughs> I do the math in my truck when I'm hunting, you know, down in Kansas. I go, God, if somebody would break into my truck, I'd lose like three thousand dollars worth of gear just in the stuff that I have on me, right? That now. you're wearing, <laughs> <laughs> and that's in my pack. Yeah. You know, it's binocs and rangefinders and right. my bow and then right. clothes and all that stuff. Yeah, in my pack. But yeah, it's expensive. But the the difference is too. You know, for buying Under Armour, you have to buy five sets. Yeah, right. And so that might be fifty bucks a uh, uh, a piece. First light is a hundred, but you only have to buy two or three. Yeah. And it and it lasts, um, you know. I, I I've had stuff that's seven or eight years years old. Hey Ryan, yeah, I was curious if you could explain this picture for us, please. That's a beautiful kuyu. Yeah, so uh, kudu, kudu, yeah. <laughs> we we went. My, you just heard it. You just heard it. Yeah. <laughs> my uncle and I, uh, my uncle had been to Africa. I want to say ten or eleven years ago, and. I think it was eight years ago. He asked me if I wanted to go. It was like an archery hunt. I see your bow. Yeah. So it's strictly archery. We were in um, South Africa. We flew into Johannesburg and drove four hours north into the Limpopo province. Okay. And so we were hunting right on the border of South Africa and Botswana. Wow. So where I shot that, that this kudu, um, it was... I want to say a mile from Botswana, from the Botswana border. Um, okay. This is a 51-inch kudu, which for those of, of you who know um, kudu and, and how they score, 51 is a is a pretty big kudu. Yeah. yeah. Is, especially for, for archery hunting. It's a really impressive um, rack. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it's cool. Uh, kudu, if you look down the their horns, how they spiral, mm-hmm. you can see 
uh, like right down the the horns. You just follow it right down. Yeah, down there. Yeah, it's, cool. it's pretty cool. Because when they're fighting, when they put their horns down, they can look up and see through that uh, that that circle and see when they're fighting, which is like a peep sight, cool. right? Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. It's crazy. So yeah, yeah, I've seen photos of that. It is pretty cool. It's a perfect. Kyle, do you want to pull up the Eland picture quick from Africa, please? Well. I'll, I'll talk about all these. Um, was, was this all here. part of the same trip? Yeah, we were over there for 14 days. So tell what well, he's doing that. Tell us how like this came about. Like you get this call or something? Or? So my uncle asked if I was interested in going to Africa. And I said, yeah, 100%. Like, oh, I don't know. Let me think about That'd it. That'd be awesome. So you have to set it up a year in advance. Okay. Right? So we went in the, we went in August. Okay. And we had everything planned the, the previous August. Because you have to book the outfitters. You have to get all your flights and all that stuff lined up. I mean, it's it's not... It's not cheap to, to go over there. Um, but, and then you have to, you just have to plan for everything and, and prepare. So it's, uh, it, it's definitely a year, at least a year planning. And a lot of times it's two years cause you have to save up money because mm-hmm. you have to put deposits down on everything a year in advance yeah. and then buy everything and then, um, and then pay the rest when you get down there. But this, this animal right here is an eland. And when I shot this, this was the number two eland in the world um that that i shot for the safari club record books but this is an 1800 pound animal this is the biggest plains game animal in the world how did you i got to hear this whole story of this eland especially how did you tell me about the hunt like i want you because i'm like i'm geeked about this right now i gotta tell you man you know as an avid hunter i get excited about all the aspects of the hunt so like they say today we're hunting eland is it like well you they have so many, an- it's, it's crazy hunting over in Africa versus hunting here. When you hunt here, you're, when you hunt for whitetails, you maybe see, you'll see some whitetails. You might see a grouse, you might see a coyote or a fox or something, but that's yeah. usually it. Right. Out West, you can maybe get an elk or mule deer when you're hunting. Yeah. Over there, you'll see 15 different species in at the same time because we hunt over water holes. Okay. And so they all come in to, to drink and you. So like they, these are blinds? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, um, you're testing out your first light sweating in the blind. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't have first light back at that point, but um, so you're funky, man. I mean, Everyone's but, like, who's the smelly guy? The nice thing is they do laundry for you every day. Oh, you're in the lot. You get, you're in a really nice lodge and they okay. all, yeah, they do laundry for you every, every day. But, um, they, you, you let them know what you, what you're looking for, what you want to hunt. And they will have specific areas on their land that okay like the eland herd usually goes to this section or whatever so if you tell them that you want to hunt an eland they'll put you in a blind and and then you literally just um sit there and wait and wait until they come in some days they'll come in some days they won't you know yeah. it's i mean it's, yeah. it's 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 hunting right so um there, there's no guarantees but you'll see giraffes impala ostriches baboons elands <laughs> spring buck um water buck kudu all, all all in the same sit. It's crazy. So you're just hanging out, and this eland just comes. Your luck. You're on a water hole, I assume. Yeah, and it wasn't just one eland. It was thirty or forty, and so they they all come in, and you have to wait until when a herd like that rolls in. You have to wait until you know it clears, so you can get a shot without um, hitting two at the same time. Yeah. Um, or the one and, you're not aiming yeah, for because right. yeah. they're just packed in there, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's. Uh, so luckily that one came in. Um, he was he was by himself and drinking, and he was kind of quartered towards me. Okay, and I, I had to wait. Quartered in a little bit. Yeah, I, I waited till he he stepped forward and kind of opened up oh, his yeah. shoulder. Yep. Um, Showed and, you the rib cage. So it, the crazy thing is the animals in Africa. You have to aim a different way than you do for mm-hmm. for white tails. So oh. white tails, you know, you aim up behind the leg, right right behind the leg, behind the shoulder. Um, if you do that in Africa, you'll miss, you'll miss the vitals. The vitals are straight up the leg. So okay. you have to shoot a lot far for the, a lot for the bone. Forward. Well, the bone, the bone structure in Africa there, the bones go up and then they like curl around. Right, so right. that pocket, you can still right up the leg. You, you hit that pocket and there's no bone there. We're on a white tail straight up the leg. You hit that, that shoulder joint right. and you're, you know, yeah. arrow may or may not make it through. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and as you keep talking about the philosophies of hunting we don't hunt to wound right yeah exactly you're, you're hunting to harvest and, and in preparation for that trip um i shot my bow i'd say you know 10 to 12 shots a day for three months leading yeah. up to that and i got so good that i could hit three shots you know touching at 20 yards 
That's with, awesome. without, a, without an issue. I'm not that good anymore because I just, I haven't practiced and I, I need to get back to that. Um, but then I also had to, I bought a book that specifically shows all the vitals for the, for the animals in there to study on where you, you know, where the, the lungs are and, and where you want to make the shot on those animals. Cause over in Africa, every, t every animal you shoot, you have to pay a trophy fee for. Yep. And you, if you draw blood, you pay a trophy fee. So for like a kudu, for example, you pay twenty one hundred dollars whether you retrieve that animal or not. Okay, so you got to make sure the chat counts. So that's why I practice. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot of money. And to, then you uh, have to have them uh, mounted. Yeah. And then you have to have them shipped to America. Yep, it's it was an expensive hunt. Yeah, tell us. Go ahead and tell us tell us the prices of the. I'm sure uh -oh, they have. Here we go. Each place has their. Uh, he might need a tissue. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they have I their own taxidermists over there, and so they'll ship it to you. We. Being that my dad's a taxidermist, right? We we brought all of our stuff back on. Um, oh, you did. Yeah, just in crates. But overall, the trip I think was about fifteen grand. <sighs> um, and that was it. Cost twelve hundred bucks just to ship the animals back. Mm -hmm. So that's that's twelve hundred there. I mean, the flights were two grand. The lodging was I think three hundred bucks a day. Um, and then you when, get your your when, guide, right? Yeah, the the lodging and guide is included, right? So like that's that's three hundred bucks a day. But we were there for fourteen days. Um. And then your trophy fees on top of that. So once you get over there, you can spend as much or as little money as you want. And when I got over there, I started flinging arrows. And in the first, I think, six days, I had six animals down. And I go, what all did my, you knock down? I got to stop. I had to cut myself off from hunting because I go, <laughs> my checkbook can't afford this. I had, to, I had to borrow money from my uncle. Oh, here we go. Here's another yeah. one. So that that was the number one spring buck in the world uh, when I shot it. This is all the same trip. Yeah. How did you just come across like number one, number two? Well, they they score them and then you look them up on on the Safari Club International. The most amazing. So, and I never registered any of mine with SEI just because I got lazy and didn't do it. But when I looked it up and I could see my score and then see what it was. Am I looking at a recurve? Uh no, that's a Excalibur crossbow. Oh, so it, oh it, I it, see. It is a recurve. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's an it's an Excalibur crossbow. I got gotcha. you. What is what is SCI? Safari Club International. That's the, I'd say like probably the biggest hunting organization in the world, maybe. Yep. Right? I agree. Uh, yeah. And they score animals because Boone and Crockett does not score certain animals. Right. But uh, Safari Club does. They refer them. to them as exotics. Yeah. They don't, yep. ex they don't score uh, yep. exotic. And, and Safari Clubs, I think a little, when it comes to deer and elk. They don't deduct. They don't deduct. Exactly. Right. That's what I was trying to shoot out of my mouth there. Yeah. And so after six days, um, <laughs> you're starting to feel like that pocket's well, light. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I, this was back. We had to bring cashier's checks. This was before really electronic payments were a thing. Right. Right. So I had to they didn't take Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, I had to borrow money from my uncle. I go, hey, hey, Todd, can I borrow a couple grand so I can buy, so I can shoot some more animals. And, uh, <laughs> and he gave me that. So, um, but I had to take a break from hunting. So we actually went golfing one day on one of the, the ranches over there. Um, one of the owners, his nephew was a really good golfer and was trying to make the PGA. So he built a golf course for him, a PGA golf course on his land. What? And it was right on the Botswana border. So the I think it's the, the Limpopo River splits South Africa and Botswana. And so we went golfing one day because I'm like, I, I can't. I have to I have to cut myself off from shooting animals, otherwise I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll go broke. Right. And so <laughs> our our professional hunter and his wife and I and another guy, the four of us went golfing and on the golf course. Did they, you have sticks with you or you just brought no, somebody else's? No, clubs? they 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 golf all the time over there. You know. Okay, I was and, like, you just brought golf clubs no, with you to Africa. So I, I just I just used a random set just yeah just for fun and yeah. you know, we were just kind of screwing around and drinking beers and stuff. Yeah. Um. But on the golf course over there, they have a. They have science beware of the hippos because hippos <laughs> are the most dangerous animal in Africa. I mean, they kill more people than in the are. world, right? I don't, probably. Yeah, I mean, I and they're know, pretty they're, dangerous. So, and you can see the hippos in the river just as you're golfing, and then saw wart, warthogs running across the fairways and stuff. I mean, it's it's crazy golfing. It was a very cool experience to be able to to golf in Africa on a hundred. I know the Cape buffalo is the uh, most dangerous animal in the world. But I think hippos have got the honor of uh, the most dangerous. They've killed more people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every year, I think they yeah. they kill the most people in Africa. They're amazing. they're mean. They are. Um, yeah, and, and they're big. Yeah, they're huge. Have you ever seen, <laughs> at the Deer Classic two years ago? There was one of the purveyors there had a booth and he had a hippo skull. 
It's prehistoric. I mean, the teeth, right. the two bottom teeth are literally this long. Uh, it's just amazing. But you can see when they get mad, and they can. I think they can run a short burst up to 20 or 30 miles an hour or something like that when they charge. Yep. I mean, you don't have a chance. Right. Well, I tell you what, guys, uh, as much as I hate to break up the talk of animal hunting, we're going to need to just get to a quick break here and to have a word from our sponsors. But when we come back, Ryan... We're going to get into all things music, man, because I know this is something you're so passionate about. Heck yeah. And so uh, I'm pumped to get into all that with you, too. Sounds good. All right. We'll be right back. If you would like to sponsor the Boots and Backstraps podcast or you have an interest in joining our team, send us an email to bootsandbackstraps at gmail.com. When we last left you, Ryan was giving us his uh, exploits of knocking down animals and writing fat checks in uh, Africa. Yep. But we got to shift gears now, TK. I'm on it, man. I'm excited. Well, as much as I love hunting, uh, country music and hunting right both i mean country music was such a big part of my life and uh even though i'm retired now i might be coming out of retirement for the wee fest again nice. uh oh that's what the rumors are that i'm hearing who knows but i love country music and uh ryan you are involved with country music yep please tell us about your organization uh this is not about me today this is all about you yeah why don't we go back Let's get in the way back machine for a minute. Yep. And tell us how you got interested in. I mean, obviously, growing up, you probably listened to country. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, how your sort of fandom took off as you got into adulthood and all that. Yeah, and it started again. You know, back when I was a kid, my my parents listened to John Denver, um, Johnny Cash, all that's you know all those the the old school uh, country artists, and we'd be taking road trips every summer out to out west. We'd go visit you know Yellowstone or um four corner national park all, just all all sorts of different badlands all sorts of different stuff out west every we take a week every year my mom was a teacher so she had the summers off um and we had cassette tapes back in the day so that's that's what we would listen to um he doesn't mean eight tracks he means like time. actual cassette yeah. tapes and and then when, when i got into what do you mean they don't have eight tracks anymore good luck finding a player <laughs> <laughs> probably going for a lot of money on ebay right now actually. right, yeah, right? exactly tapes. But so I, it started, you know, back then. And then when I got into um, high school and college, I kind of veered away from country music. But once I got, once I got out of college, uh, I started or my last year or two of college, I started listening to, to more country music um, and went to We Fest a couple of times back in the day. And then yeah. that kind of that 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 kicked it off and uh, put it into hyperdrive. And it's, I don't know. <laughs> Do you remember the years you were there? Yes. So 2001 or 2002 was my first okay. first year that I'd been to WeFest. Do you remember Christmas. who the headliners were? I remember George Strait played Sunday night. It was yep. it was the uh it was the Thursday to Sunday. Yeah. Back then. Um and I believe and Toby Keith was one of them as well. I think I went Saturday and Sunday. I don't I only went two days. I believe um, that year we also had Tim McGraw. I think so. Yeah. Yep. And uh because I remember Toby Keith because it was right after it was the summer after nine eleven, okay. And he played, uh, Ang I think it's Angry American. Is that the the song where it's we'll put the a boot in your, your ass? ass. Yeah, it's the American best right? ever. <laughs> yeah, um, and that was you know obviously everybody just went nuts when he when he played that song. But I remember that fifty thousand people going yeah, crazy. <laughs> I remember that in George Strait, and then I I went a, a couple years after that, um, and then maybe in like two thousand seven, and then starting I want to say in twenty ten. I've I've been every year since then. Wow! So except last year, right? I, yeah, right. Well, and 
I mean, last year was crazy for for everybody. Yes. Right. But right. Um, for WeFest in general, it was because people weren't sure if it was going to happen or not. And me, I, like selfishly, um, I was supposed to be in Tokyo for the Olympics this past summer. And so I was happy when the, they said WeFest wasn't going to happen because I go, all right, that's perfect. I don't have to miss WeFest because it's the same time that the Olympics were. Yeah. Um, but everything got canceled. So it, right. You know, like, yeah, it's an right. interesting story. Um, the new owners of the WeFest. Yeah, it's uh seven years ago. I think it was seven years ago. Uh, the we sold the WeFest to uh, is the town, town Square, Square Media yep. out of New Hampshire, and uh, it didn't fare well with them. That's all <laughs> I guess I will say. I'll yeah, that's try and be a nice little way. diplomatic about yeah. it. Uh, it was it was a little different, right? <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it, don't want to burn any bridges or, or right. say anything bad, but it right. just it wasn't the same as the previous no. ownership. It was, and it was nowhere near as good. No, right. Yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they just recently sold to iHeart Radio or iHeart Festivals, and they decided when they bought it, and this is before Corona, they decided we're not going to uh, do a We Fest next year. We're going to get our eggs in a row, or our ducks in a row, rather. And we're going to mend some bridges that were burnt. Yep. yep. And so they look like, uh, they come off looking like uh, rocket scientists because then all of a sudden the coronavirus hit and they couldn't have done it anyway. Right. Yep. So kudos to them and good for them. And now this year they're starting it. And uh, what have we got? We got Blake Sheldon. Uh, it's a good lineup. Jo Florida Georgia line. And I'm sorry, I can't. Is Carrie Underwood? I, I don't know. Maybe. Killer I, I, Kyle on I, the Google I, machine. I, I who are the headliners for WeFest yeah. 2021? I haven't been paying attention because, again, I'm supposed to be in Tokyo this year if it, if it happens. So I hadn't paid, had paid, hadn't paid much attention to it. But yeah. um, I did see uh, FGL and, and Blake Shelton. Um, it, it, and oh, I, I'm really, Dirk Bentley. Oh, yeah. Okay. Dirk Bentley is uh, the third headliner. That is correct. I, I've been oh, nice. uh, up on stage with Dirk Bentley at WeFest before. <laughs> is that is that right? Yeah. Is that true? I remember, that uh, I remember calling security. We had to escort <laughs> you out. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. I think we might have an actual pick of this. Look at this. Yeah. So again, for the listening audience that uh, don't have the video feed, we've got a picture of Ryan on stage with Dirk Bentley, and they're having a little conversation here. Yeah. I'll be darned. Was I he, do Is he handing you a bush that. latte? Is that what that is? B bud latte. Oh. Bud latte there. Uh, I, I had a sign. Did you feel like you were cheating? <laughs> <laughs> cheating on Coors? Yeah. Ryan. Yeah. Nice boots. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish I'd had them. You know, that's a very classy outfit that I'm wearing there. Like, I remember that. Boots. It's weed yeah, fast. Really? Yeah. Said, What's that guy doing out there? <laughs> yeah, so I had a sign um, that said uh, "Shotgun?" Question mark Daria, and I was in the third row, and he walked over in his second song, and it was a neon green sign, right? So I held the sign up, and it, he obviously saw me because you know just a little bit farther away than than TK and I are right now. Um, he goes, "Yep, gotcha." And he gave you the point. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and you're like, "It's on." Yeah, and he walked over. Jerusalem never turned on a drinking challenge. Right. <laughs> so he walked over and tapped the during his next song. Uh, tap the camera guy on the shoulder. He's like, get that guy on video. He goes, hold up your sign. So I held it up and he goes, you want a shock and a beer? I go, yeah. He goes, all right, two beers. And so he had his <laughs> tournament. He's like, come on up here. So I went up there, had his tour manager bring two beers over and uh, shotgun to beer in front of 70,000 people uh, with, with Dirk Bentley. Who won? He crushed me. <laughs> but I will say, I've been, at that point, I had been drinking for 12 hours. Yeah, he probably hadn't and, had anything yet. And my only goal was, don't throw up on the WeFest stage. <laughs> <laughs> How bad would that have been? Oh, man. Right? You're talking about going from famous to infamous? Yeah, right. <laughs> Not in a good way. Guy. Not in a good way. <laughs> what a great guy Dirk Bentley is. The first time we had him there, he had just come out with, uh, what was the song? Free and easy down the road I go. No. Nope. No. What was I no, thinking? No, the first one. What, what, what was, was I thinking? thinking? Yeah, what was I thinking? Yeah. Okay. And he was uh, just standing on the side of the stage where I was standing, and... Uh, he was tuning a guitar and I said, Dirks, how are you? And he says, hi, I'm glad to be here and all that. And I said, I'm glad to see that you're in there doing your own guitars. And he says, yeah, well, someone's got to do it. It ain't going to get done by itself. I said, well, you keep writing songs like that and you'll have someone else tuning your guitar before long. And I think the next year he was, he, he had, had somebody tuning, he had a tech. He yes. had his own crew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He puts but on a great show. I've seen him a few I times. I was so impressed with his show. Uh, I don't know if he still does it, but, you know, he'd do that deal where he'd bring someone up on stage and he would 
get a little routine going with him. Then you have him cover their eyes, and he's got a surprise for them. And he and the entire band would leave the stage, and that person would stand there and stand there. And finally, they'd go, what's going on? And they'd pull their eyes down, and they'd turn around, and they're the only person on the stage. <laughs> and that stage happens to be the largest stage on the planet. Right. It's close to a, a football field big. I mean. It's I'm, huge. It, it is you. Can you imagine never being on stage and all of a sudden you're the only person on that stage? Right. I don't know. I thought the people I laughed. Freak out. I thought that was funnier than heck. <laughs> right. It's always funny when it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Polish, so I don't mind laughing at myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you can't laugh at yourself, right? You, yeah. you got to be able to do that. It's a, and it, I'll, not to like interject your story here, yeah. right? But it's a wildly different animal being backstage. TK gave us some backstage passes one year. We went back there and it's just like this. It's like a hornet's nest of golf carts and people RVs working and yeah. people running around with the, like the headsets on. And it's crazy back there. I was like, whoa. Yeah. The backstage at, at WeFest yeah. is it's um, organized chaos. It is kind of right. It, Absolutely. It's, very, it's very organized, yeah. but there's people running around everywhere. It's pretty and cool. The, to the see. people that work back there and some of the partners that always say, why would anyone want to come back here? You know, everyone thinks it's the greatest thing in the world to get a backstage pass. There's just, a, you know, hundreds of people here working their butts off. Why would you want to come back? They think, people must think, well, it's a big party back there. You're going to drink beer with the celebrities. It really doesn't work that way. No. Well, I will say, so at, at a festival, it's backstage at a festival is completely different than backstage at a concert. Just a, just right. a concert. Because right. at, at a regular concert at the X or Target Center or wherever it is, that's a, I mean, that's what you're talking about, where it's a, a big party. Backstage. You got to go there now, man. You, you pulled the lid off. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the the first time I'd ever been backstage at a concert was. Yeah. Um, who was the show? Luke Bryan at uh, U.S. Bank Stadium. Did you have bling your jeans or did Luke? Uh, Luke definitely did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so I was with, um, I had bought VIP pit passes uh, for a friend of mine and I drew. And then uh, we went with. Justin Fontaine and Eric Howell, and they're both playing for the Wild at that yep. time. Yeah, and so they were the ones who hooked up backstage. Couple passes. of forwards. Yeah, yeah. Howell yeah. ended up going to the Vegas Knights, right? Yep, for a couple of years, and uh, then he went down to Florida, and he's with Nashville right wow. now. Um, good player. Yeah, yep, really good player, and better guys, right? They're they're both super super cool guys, uh, both him and and Justin. Um, and so we had backstage passes, and. We had no clue what we were, where we were going, what we were doing. Nobody at U.S. Bank Stadium did because that was the very first show at U.S. Bank Stadium. Was this so was the, the backstage pass? Event. Is something you you won that or you bought the backstage? No, no. The Eric and and Justin had that hooked up through the through the wild. Okay. Um, Luke's tour manager, I can't remember what his name was. I don't know if it was Evan. Or I, I can't remember the guy's name, but sure, he had hooked a handful of the guys up with backstage passes. And, oh, cool. And then we got in, included in that, and we get into the they call it the radio room. Yep. Um, and there's two coolers of beer, any sort of alcohol you want, mixers, all that stuff, whatever. And we were the only four people back there at, at this point. Cause we got there early. I'm like, this is awesome. And then a bunch more people came back. We were playing flip cup backstage before the concert mm -hmm. and just having a good old time. Um, like and at this point is Luke's not in there or they, no. any of the openers are in there. No. Okay. No. Cause Dustin Lynch was the opener. We actually okay. had meet and greets for him. And uh, I've heard he's a good dude too. Yeah. He's, he's a super nice guy. Um, so at this concert, we were, again, sitting back there playing flip cup and just drinking and have a good, having a good old time. Uh, so then we'd go out and watch, watch the shows. Well, during Luke Bryan's show, I went back there to, to grab a beer. There's a bunch of people in there. I wasn't even paying any attention, right? I go into the cooler, grab a, grab a couple of beers, look up, and Little Big Town is standing right there talking right to- Right in front of you. Yeah, to uh, the K-102 folks. Um, and I look up and I go- Hey guys, how's it going? And just, you know, sit there and talk with them for a little while. And then uh, I asked Karen Fairchild if I could get a, a picture with her. And is, is her husband Jimmy? Is that, I, I can't. I think yeah. so, yeah. And so I go, hey, Jimmy, can you take a picture of us? He goes, hold on a second. You want me to sit here and take a picture of you and my wife? Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like and it ain't been done he, before. And he goes, all right, sounds good. Here you go. Well so, played, man. Well so then, played. Um, uh, yeah, just sat there and, and talked to him for a little bit and then went, went back out and continued to watch the concert. But that was my first backstage experience. And people, since that was the first concert at U.S. Bank Stadium, everybody's asking, how was it? You know, how were the lines and all that stuff? I go, 
my experience is different than everybody else's. I, I can't tell you because we had our own bathrooms, free beer, free alcohol, everything. So I'm like, yeah. It was awesome from my standpoint, but I don't know how everybody I'll work for everybody else. Not to like get into too much of the dirt, but I'm curious. Yeah. Like Erica and Eric and Justin, did they have a few drinks with you and like party a little bit? Oh yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, we we yeah, yep. That's good. We were all having a good time. Good. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Question for you because you're talking hockey. Care to give us the background story on this pitcher? Uh oh. Yeah. So actually. So this is you doing what? Because you remember that like half of the people that are catching this podcast are on the audio platform. Yeah. So. so Let's let's go back to the picture of me and Brantley Gilbert first, because that'll kind of kick it off, and it's it's kind of all one story that I'll that I'll share with everybody. Um, I got to do that with Brett Hedekin with, uh, when the uh, when the Hurricanes won. He's a St. Cloud guy, right? Yep. Or he he went to St. Cloud State, I believe. Yep. Okay, yep. Hedy, yeah. that's what they call him. There we go. There. You on stage with Brantley Gilbert. So this was, I I can't remember what year it was. This might be 2014. Um, Brantley Gilbert. So he was, was just starting to get to be a big deal then. Yeah. Well, he was, this was Saturday night. Uh, he was the second to last show. Zach Brown band was after Ooh, Brantley. Okay. And, Love. uh, it had stormed really bad that afternoon. And so a lot of people left and weren't, weren't watching the show. Um, and I somehow got front row seat. So I was center stage front row and I was just having a, a blast right just jamming out and having a good time because this is the first time i'd been front row for anything yeah and brantley kept looking down and he, he you know give me a thumbs up and and uh do whatever when he when he was playing and i saw him walk over to his tour manager in the corner and he pointed over to the area where i was at and then i saw him walk back out and i go he's got to be doing something over here i don't know if he's going to give away a guitar or whatever yeah uh so then the we fest vip uh, our, the, the WeFest security guys came over and they said, all right, they told everybody, Brantley Gilbert's going to come down here, so we're clearing some people out. Um, and then Brantley's personal security guards came down after that. And uh, His personal security yeah, team. Yeah, he has a, a, a couple of personal security guards. Not that he guards, needs it because he's pretty right. stacked. And uh, Mark, the the head of the uh, VI, WeFest VIP security, came over and said, Brantley wants to bring you up on stage with him. Are you okay with that? I said, Heck yeah. It's awesome. So, so he brings me up on stage. Um, you know, you can see that picture of, of us on stage. He hands me his microphone, lets me close out his concert right before Zach Brown band and just walks off the stage. I'm like, <laughs> all right, this is awesome. So I got to close out his show. So what did you do? I finished the song. You did? Yeah, of course. That is awesome. And then, and then after the song, I go, what am I supposed to do now? And he goes, do whatever you want. The stage is yours. And he walked off. So I just sat there and like hung out with the band and uh, <laughs> danced for a couple of couple seconds and then got down and went back to the campground and kept drinking. What <laughs> song was it? Do you remember what it was? Yeah, Country Must Be Countrywide. Okay. Yep. And then as I'm walking back to the to our campsite, people go, God, you sound just like Brantley Gilbert. I go, How drunk are you? Because I do not <laughs> sound like But so that was Saturday night. And then uh the picture that, that Kyle had just showed was me drinking out of the Stanley Cup. Uh a friend of mine was line mates and roommates the guy in the in the low right corner right hand corner there's matt green he played up at und okay um, and my buddy nick fear was uh matt's line mate uh and roommate back in college and matt had won the stanley cup with uh the la kings and so nick met nick at we fest um and we had all camped together and that year he said greeners having a stanley cup party after after we fest so i'll i'll stick around for another year he just got a coaching job up in canada so he was heading up there and i go dude can i please be your plus one for the stanley cup party because one of my goals in life was to drink out of the stanley cup and uh and is now correct me if i'm wrong but when they win the cup doesn't each player get it for like a 24 week? hours 24 hours okay yep. every every player coach and member of the organization um gets gets the cup for 24 hours and the, the team plane flies it around or what I don't think it's a team plane. I think it's the NHL plane. Yep. Yeah, because okay. the the keeper of the cup is with with the cup with the gloves and all yeah. that. Wow. So we were hanging out with that guy. How um, like you must have got goosebumps. It was awesome. What a yeah. fun life that guy has. Yeah, he's seen some crazy. <laughs> he just travels crazy stuff. around with the Stanley yeah. Cup and goes to parties. Yeah. And so I Saturday night I was up on stage with Brantley Gilbert. Yeah. Monday night I was crushing Coors Light out of the Stanley Cup. I get back to work on Tuesday. And I'm sitting at my desk and I'm like, just depressed. I go, how can I ever top that? And yeah, like, you can't. I, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to, that was a, 
at that at the time that was a pretty good 48 hours <laughs> for me. so I, I couldn't complain about that oh uh, well hopefully you'll be talking about boots and back straps for the rest of your life heck yeah <laughs> oh yeah add this to his uh resume yep 100 <laughs> percent. so tk did you you guys um did, uh, how many times did you have brantley up there um in the 35 i think we had them three times okay three i could be wrong but we do have a reference i've heard he's a good dude too though yeah yeah they all are you know we have a reference it's behind uh ryan back there yeah we joe have, can you grab that quick we have a poster of the first 25 years of the we fest people ask me about artists and what year they were there and i have no idea i was kind of surprised i remembered tim mcgraw the year that george Strait was there yeah that's the one and yep. toby keith yeah bring I it right can, over here to tom's side please i can never remember it's kind of a blur they all yeah. blend together well when you've done so many of them and you have what you know 10 or 12 artists more than that yeah every year. in Thank the you. old days back in the 80s we started before noon forgive me uh yeah turn it the other way the folks, way she gave it to you you folks in the crowd I guess I'll hold it here and you read it. Well, well, I don't, I'm not going to read everything on there because no, otherwise no. we're going to burn a lot of Ryan's time. But you can see that there are, you know, we'll just do some quick math. What was that's, that? That's Ryan's department. 91? But this is five by five. So 25 years of WeFest on there. Yeah, where's the... That's right, right? 25? Five by five? Yep, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> According to my math, yeah. I, I got to double check, you know. <laughs> 2002. I'm going to hold this close to you. Toby yeah. Keith... Martina McBride, Brooks, all oh, is Brooks and Dunn. That's that's okay. Um, Alabama, Trisha Yearwood, Sawyer Brown, Blackhawk, Jody Messina. I mean, that's a great lineup. Just, oh yeah, just in those right there. That was that was the year that I was there, two thousand two. Because two thousand two, it was Brooks and Dunn Miss that, that uh, closed out Sunday night. Okay, not not uh, not George Strait. That was my bad. A king of country music. He's my favorite. I mean, I I like a lot of country, obviously, like you. Yeah, but he's definitely the top of the food chain for me. And he's coming George back. George Strait my idol as well how many times has he been up at we fest twice okay when he first he's a great story about george Strait, by the way yeah, let's hear it which story <laughs> like the first time that you had him there he told me about the whole thing first time we had george there mm -hmm. i'm sorry give me another clue oh just about how humble he was oh absolutely he still is and you were talking about how how you'd want to maybe have him back and oh well both times he was there he well, after he was done you know everyone wants to meet george Strait. he walked right up to me and just shook my hand and said boy that was great and i'd love to come back and both times i said well you don't have to twist my arm <laughs> <laughs> i would have him back every year uh but he had retired you know and that last time we had him here and so we brought george Strait out of retirement I mean, he still does shows, but he kind of officially retired. He wasn't like having tours anymore. Right. He just played gigs occasionally. Yeah. And uh, one of the fun stories was someone else we brought out of retirement was Alabama. You know, when we first did the WeFest in 1983, you know, we got our heads together and he says, well, we got to blow this out. I mean, we got to do this right. And I said, well, the only band that we got to get is Alabama. If we can get Alabama, we're going to blow it out. And we were just a bunch of young guys running around. Not We didn't know what we were doing, quite frankly. Just country music fans, right? Yeah. And uh, we were hiding. I don't, I don't know. I don't know going into the logistics, but we got Alabama. And we got them because they're just the greatest guys in the world. And so in 1983, man, they're out there. I got right in the front row. And I just watched the whole I nice. forgot to get back up on stage and close it out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I I'll always remember, and I've told the story on stage a hundred times, there was this little guy. Was Randy looking at you like, uh, you're supposed to be Randy, up here? <laughs> Randy wasn't even involved then. This is pre-Randy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeff Krieger and uh, uh, Terry McCloskey and Szynski, the Mattress Factory. That's a story in itself. And Cheryl Sparks, uh, myself. Um, no, I'm talking about Randy Owen. Randy Owens. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, Randy. Uh, Not WeFest Randy. Yeah. Alabama Randy. <laughs> Forgive us. Why would uh, WeFest Randy be standing on stage? <laughs> Party. Um, Randy Owens uh, was absolutely the nicest guy I've ever met. One of the 
still probably today, even though it's been many years since I've seen him, absolutely one of the kindest, givingest, generous guys, and so talented and so fun. Ran, they were doing mountain music. Yeah. You know, they're big, big deal. Still I now. Mean, all, all, and it, by 83, because they started out around 79, 80, and by 83, they've had a number of hits. And, That's about when you started out, isn't it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they started, they kicked into mountain music, and then right in front of the stage, there was this little kid who was tall and skinny and just looked like a, a hillbilly boy out of the Blue Ridge Mountains. You know, he was flopping his arms around, and Randy started laughing. He couldn't <laughs> couldn't continue, so they stopped the song. And he, he just reached down there, and the security guys helped, brought him up on stage, and then he kicked into Mountain Music again. And the whole time they played Mountain Music, that little kid was out there just throwing his arms around and kicking. No rhyme or rhythm to him. He just kicking up, and everyone was just dying. And I know the kid, and I knew his mother and father. They were workers at the Wee Fest. And I watched that little kid grow up, and now he's, I think he's, I think he's gone. I think he passed away a few years oh, ago. That's and, too bad. And watch him, for, and we always, every time we saw him, we told the story of him in Alabama up on that stage, just lighting it up. And Randy Owens laughing so hard, he had to stop the song and start over again. I mean, those were some of the first memories. And forgive me if I drifted off the topic. No, you're um, you're loud rabbit holes on this yeah, podcast, yeah. bro. <laughs> That's a good story. We uh, great memory for that guy too. Uh, we needed uh, someone big, so we Alabama was kind enough to come all the way up to the North Country and perform at a, an event that wasn't proven. Yep. But because they were there, all of a sudden we were on the map. You're on the map. Yep. We were on the map big time. And I mean, we had Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash. Um, I'd have to look at the <laughs> the banner again to see uh, some of the other acts. Hank Williams Jr. I think a Hank times. Jr. was only there once, and oh, my right, okay. goodness, I mean, he was there the last year I was there, uh, my thirty fifth year. Um, but he, <laughs> as much as I love his music, he's a he's a little bit to deal with. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could tell that just from. <laughs> Uh, Let's just say I would never pay specifically to go to one of his shows after yeah, he had, after seeing what I saw at We Fest. His his, his shows got good, better. But, um, okay, he got a lot of grief from a lot of people, and he grew and he matured, and uh, he uh, liked to sit down and just jam out all his songs. People wanted to hear those great Hank Williams Jr. songs, and he would just kind of jam them in and jam them out. You know, he did more shows than anybody on tour. I mean, he was doing. A show like every other day. I was gonna say year. he was doing a couple hundred a year, wasn't he? Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons he wanted. That's to a lot the... of drinking, man. <laughs> <laughs> he was hitting it hard too every night. I bet. It made me feel like a lightweight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose as long as we've got Hank Williams Jr. Uh, on the slate, I'll tell you the Hank Williams Jr. story. He was paranoid. He had been drinking all day, and it was just time to come out. And he uh, was in one of the campgrounds. And he came out, ran down the ditch, and jumped into a highway patrol car. What? I'm telling you the truth. He thought someone was out to get him. And uh, let me back up. He was not in the campground. I'm thinking of someone else. We had a helicopter pad. He came in. They picked him up where he was staying, landed him in a helicopter pad, got out of the helicopter, ran down into the ditch, up the other side into a squad car, and said, take me backstage. <laughs> and a cop was like, what? And so he did. You know, he got the out. The cop recognized him, obviously. Yeah. And he said, I'm Hank Williams Jr. He recognized him and drove him backstage. So he was feeling a little paranoid for some reason and uh, got on stage and did what we said he was going to do. Just jammed out all the songs. He was just drunk and crazy. And yep. uh, the show wasn't good. And he pulled one of his guys that was on the keyboards and Boot him off the piano, and he started banging on the piano. Took his shirt off, shooting his guns, and he was out of control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the people were booing, so it was a long, long time, probably thirty years before we had him back. Yep. But I don't yeah. like to speak poorly about anybody. I mean, that's Hank Williams Jr. Yeah, he's a wild, rowdy, and crazy. No, guy. but it happened, right? It's yeah. a story. It's a story. It's an experience. And I guess I'm not speaking poorly about him because, my goodness, 
didn't we use the Hank Williams Jr. songs in our show for many, many years? Well, I tell you what, we've, we've come light years in how country music is perceived. And one of the ways that we've done that, Mr. Ryan Pilgrim, yeah. is there's an organization locally yeah. that's helping to bring country artists, uh, country bands together. Yep. Midwest uh, Country Music Organization, right? Correct. Yep. So if you could, I, I'm really uh, excited for you to talk about that because I know I had kind of a small part in it for a moment to help with some of the events and things like that. It was lots of fun. Yeah, which we appreciate. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I just think it's a super, uh, it's a super valuable tool for local artists and bands to help grow their uh, passions and advance their careers and to like you, like you said so many times, to collaborate with other artists. Yep. So maybe if you can talk to the inception of this MWCMO. Yep. Um, and how that whole thing kind of came together. Yeah. So it started, I want to say, three years ago in um, Ellie Gilbert at the time, Ellie Grack now. Uh, her her base right recently um, married yeah uh pete our, our mutual friend pt um somebody had came to came to him and said there's a there's a need for this and you should do it and pt you know oh, okay well we'll give it a we'll give it a try and there, there was a handful of us he's a wild guy <laughs> that, right that were involved from the beginning and it, it started out um there was a need for venues and artists to be connected or put in touch in a better way than going through an agent or an agency. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the first giving artists a little more control, right? Yeah. And, and even the, even the, um, the venues, right? So if a venue needed a place on Friday night and it's Wednesday, how can they find somebody get their message out to say, what's, Hey, we need a country act Friday night. Here's the time. Here's, here's the amount. Who's available. Who's available, mm -hmm. right? And that's not easy to do unless you have no. a forum where you can put everybody in contact. So that's kind of how it started out. Um, and it and it evolved into more of uh, a community for, for artists. And we're working on the business side yet. We started with the, with the artist side and then, you know, we'll roll it out to the to the fan side as well. But it, it got to a point where, uh, right now, where uh, it, it's a good community for artists to collaborate mm -hmm. and to, to learn and... Um, talk, mentor, all, all of, just get in touch for, for artists all throughout the Midwest. And um, right now, I think we have a little over 150 members, maybe 160 or 170. I, I don't know the, the total count yet, but um, we, we had our second annual award show last year, a, a year ago this weekend, actually. And right. um, we used to be called the Midwest Country Music Association, but there is another Small entity, entity. <laughs> or, yeah, entity with with those initials. Who, after our our second award show, it got such good traction. Um, they sent us uh, a very friendly letter um, mm. through through their rep, you know, council representation that we like but don't like what you're doing. Yeah, that uh, <laughs> that we cannot use uh, a certain letter uh, or a certain abbreviation in our organization. So we we changed it up to the to the country music organization. But it, it's really uh, a a place where artists can uh can get put in touch with with each other if someone wants to put out an album you know what's a good recording studio we have partners with recording studios I, i'm terrible because i don't know all the names off the off the top of my head of the businesses that we're involved with but um and well, there's it, quite a few right yeah and we just revamped our website so our, our website now lists all of our uh business partners sponsors um we got a really good sponsorship from from tito's from from Jack Daniels, from um, Maury's, uh, Subaru, uh, from Treasure Island. Um, they're a good partner. We had the award show, the last two award shows at the Medina Entertainment Center. They've been a, a great partner. Um, but, and then the the day of the, the weekend of the award show, we have uh, kind of a, a conference, if you will, the day before. Yeah, I was going to say, because yep. it's not just this like production where you're handing out these trophies, right? right? Yep, it's it's a it's it's a weekend event and yeah. the the saturday i mean it, as much value as the award show brings for the artists on sunday the saturday is where they can sit down and have one on one sessions um we had just some breakout sessions the legal side of things copyright you know how do you handle that that sort of stuff um had a radio panel for some of our our local radio stations um you know through with with it was intercom iHeart Media, Talent Square Media, we had representation from from all the big ones just to give our our member artists an idea of what it takes to get their music on the radio and get, and get some playtime. So um, 
And there was, um, I remember there being some pretty big names flown into town for some of these forums. Yeah. Right? And, and then there's a, a songwriter forum where we, we brought people in from Nashville wow. that did a weekend series um, of, of songwriting with, you know, whoever, I think there's maybe 25 or 30 of our members that signed up for that. Um, one of the, the really, and that was, I think it was low cost or no cost for members, right? It, it was, it was low cost. Yeah. yeah I think super it was 20, low. 20 bucks or something. Like that, so. To like have a <laughs> yeah. session with a Nashville songwriter. A couple of them. I think we brought three, three in each wow. year. And, um, Jan Edwards is the, is the person who sponsored that. She's a, a, a big proponent of, uh, country music and especially, the local scene here and her, She's got her a private studio. Yeah. That's where it was at. Yep. Um, and her foundation Beautiful. and everything. And, and she sponsored it. So we're very grateful for, uh, for Jan's involvement. Shout out um, to Jan, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a plug in the yep. first podcast. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, we, we, you know, in Nashville, they have writers rounds at a bunch of the, um, the, the venues down there. And so we, we did kind of a, a similar thing where we would have one artist be the, the host artist and they would bring one or two other people with them. And it was just an acoustic set, um, usually on a, on a weekday night. So what didn't cut into their, uh, their performance time on a Tour Friday schedule. or Saturday. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it, it didn't take away from a venue either. Right. Of, you know, a, a big night for them to have a full band. So, um, that was very successful. Um, and, then obviously COVID hit and we had to, to reel everything back. So our, our plan um, as things start ramping back up is to get into those, the, the writer's round thing where you can do that, you know, with acoustic, like acoustic artists. So you don't break the capacity of rules or anything like that. And you can mm -hmm. do that on a, um, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night type of thing. So, yeah. um, and it's, you know, it's, it's just helping art, helping local artists out is really, and, and I shouldn't even say local. It's it's helping any artist out, um, you know, throughout the Midwest or anywhere. We won't turn anybody down if they're in. We have I think a couple of members from Texas. There are a handful of our members that live in Nashville, um, all throughout the the U.S. It's just a organization of people helping people and trying to advance everybody's music career and help people out as much as possible. And and uh, we should give a shout out to the other board members. I know you mentioned PT, yep. and of course you mentioned Allie. Yep, and then uh, Bob Keasley. Yeah, Bob. And um, uh. Matt Gronke. Yeah. Our, and Matt's the newest guy, right? Yes. Yep. And so it's been uh, the five of us. And, and Allie just recently um, resigned. And I, I should, so right now it's it's PT, myself, Matt, and Bob, mm -hmm. um, and Drew Sherman from Maiden Dixie. Um, he, he was one of the original founding members and founding board members until yep. uh, he and his family moved up to Alaska. Which I was going to say, didn't cool. he go to like the tundra? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he and his and his wife and their daughter moved up to Alaska. So. so Drew and I have like an interesting connection. How's that? So back in my performance days, I did live performance years and years ago. And the band that I founded, because I was the lead singer and founder of this band that was called North Gone South. And North Gone South, when I like left and a few of the other members that were kind of part of the core North Gone South group, Erica Hansen. Yep, I know her. Was the female lead for North Gone South. Okay. That's how I met her. She's one of our, our mem musician members of the She is. Oh, yep, yep. And we're hoping to get her on here at some point. Nice. So, yeah, I, I haven't called her yet, so now she's going to know because she'll see <laughs> right? this. But, yeah. yeah, she's going to be on my call. She's probably like, why haven't you called me yet? <laughs> so anyway, so she was the female lead for this North okay. Gone South project. And then um, after a few of us left... Um, Drew and some other folks that were from, is it Rand McNally? Okay, yep. I have the, heard that. Uh, or no, McNally Smith. Sorry, not Rand McNally. I was going to say, I know that name, but. Uh, <laughs> McNally Smith, local okay, music gotcha. uh, school. Like oh, yeah, Jesse yep. Becker and Drew and uh, John and uh, Tyler. Channing. Ch yep. So like all those guys were all McNally Smith okay. musicians. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's kind of how I think. I don't know if they were all there, but a majority of them were. And so when they came in, they changed the name from North Gone South to Maiden Dixie. So you're really like, one I'm of like, the oh, I'm one grandfather. Of the <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's... I'm like Godfather Maiden Dixie. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's hilarious. So incidentally, we had a show which you were at um, called Jack Friday. Yep. And we had Maiden Dixie awesome. headline Jack Friday. And it was really cool to like, because I knew Jesse outside of like the Maiden Dixie thing a little bit. And so we got the chance to like sit down and just reminisce about that transition yeah. of North Gone South to Maiden Dixie and Drew and like all that stuff. So. That's very cool. I've never heard that story before. Yeah. It's That's awesome. Kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. This is like, 
you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, it was North gone South. And then after that, it changed to like Brandon Backstrom, who's now with Bob FM. Um, he is okay. on their homegrown yep. show, I think. Yep. And so Brandon Backstrom was the rhythm player and the like latest, the oldest iteration of North gone South okay. as a transition to Maiden Dixie. And that's how I met Brandon too. So. Nice. Well, and Maiden Dixie did very well for themselves. They, they yeah. were even up on the We Fest yep. stage a, a, a couple of times, yep. a yep. couple of years, I think. And yeah. the, the main stage, they, I know they, they headlined uh, the, the pre-party up at the, the barn stage a couple nights, and then they also played the main stage. That as well. was a huge deal, the, the barn show. That was awesome. Oh, my goodness. Tuesday, Wednesday nights was crazy. Oh. <laughs> like, people were drinking and carrying on on a Tuesday night? <laughs> we got there at Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> the diehards would get there on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> like Ryan. For a concert that started <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> you'd wake up Thursday morning, you'd go, oh, my gosh, I feel like crap. The concerts haven't even started yet. <laughs> I used like to be able to party pretty good, but I was always tipping my hat to the people that came to the Wee Fest. I don't think I could ever have accomplished, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, oh, I'd be out of breath. Yeah, it, 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 it was a marathon, not a sprint. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. That's a. That's they have to have that mentality too. Yeah. Because when you're sort of like younger and, you know, inexperienced, we'll say that's probably the most PC way of putting mm -hmm. it. Yeah. You kind of turn the gas on too hard, too fast, right? And which a lot of people do, and I'm guilty of it as myself <laughs> oh. too. Tuesday night, you go balls to the wall and then wake up Wednesday and concerts haven't even started for another day yet. We still got like four days ahead. Do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you dial it down a little bit on Wednesday and then, uh, yeah. Don't For those me. of you that are listening that don't drink, tomorrow morning when they get up, that's as good as they're going to feel all day long, right? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Where did I hear that quote before? <laughs> I've heard that before, too, but it's funny every time. Yeah. yeah I loved uh, you had a meme at one point or just a post on Facebook that said you can't. You can't day drink if you don't start in the morning. Or no, something. no, no. Hey, come on. I'll get this right. This I'm, is, this I'm is gonna one butcher, my, I'm going to butcher it. This is one of my famous <laughs> sayings. It is one of your famous sayings. Can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. See? Isn't that great? <laughs> and that's a fact. It is. Otherwise, it's just afternoon drinking. Also, just as a sidebar, because I'm going to take a rabbit hole here for a second. Yeah, yeah. Your video that you put up. Your, your video that you put up where you uh, uh, iced yourself, I've shown like 10 people. Like, this is the funniest thing you'll ever see. Watch this. What video is this? You iced yourself. When? Is like the video is you like, oh, I got to get something out of the cabinet. And you open the cabinet door and there is ice in there. <laughs> okay, and then I you're like, oh, who did this? <laughs> that was, yeah, that was when COVID started. When we were at home. That's right. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, we all had to party by ourselves. In our, and then you kneel down and you smash that thing yeah. right there on the video. That's right. It was well, awesome. So the reason I asked the, the question is, it, again, at WeFest, there was, one night that I set a Schmirnoff ice bottle underneath one of our lawn chairs the night before to try to ice somebody. Yeah. And nobody saw it or whatever. The next morning at, I think it was at nine o'clock or nine 30, I wake up, I go sit down in the chair and knock the bottle over. And I actually did <laughs> ice myself unintentionally. And I had to slam a Schmirnoff ice at, you know, nine 30 in the morning at Weefus. So that's a good way to get the day started. So for I'm those need... uh, viewers that don't drink, I was going to explain what is ice your salt. Yeah, I was going to say you got to so, help TK. Yeah, out so it, it you <laughs> icing yourself is not the way the game is played, but <laughs> it's it's a Schmirnoff ice and you you're supposed to hide it somewhere and whoever sees the bottle of Schmirnoff ice first has to drink it. Oh, the whole and, bottle? Yeah, and so All right. my, like you're going to kneal down the, and... the, the official rules are you have to get down on one knee and slam it. Yeah. Not everybody does that, but right. for example, my my friend Abby, we were at um, just a couple weeks ago at Kona Grill in Eden Prairie, and since we couldn't meet uh, each other before Christmas because everything was closed down, we did you know exchange gifts or whatever in January, and open up my Christmas gift. There's a bottle of Schmirnoff ice sitting in the box, <laughs> and so at Kona Grill, I go, well, I know the rules, and I I slam it every time. I go. If you're going to dish it out, you got to be able to take it, right? Yep. So I got down on one knee and cornered grill in front of everybody and just slammed a schmear off Good ice. for you, man. <laughs> I, have a, I have a great story. Not to try and top yours, but I have a great story for you, too, with the ice. So uh, I was in uh, this buddy of mine, uh, Billy Bob's wedding. And this is uh, not last summer, but the summer before uh, Billy Bob, William Robert, and Greta got married. And uh, I was the s second to last groomsman in the, in the line of like five. 
and I made this plan with the groomsmen ahead of time. I was like, I'm going to ice him while he's on the altar. <laughs> like I cleared it with the wife. I cleared it with the bride. First. I was going to say, yeah, I that's, hope that's dangerous. That. That's Without dangerous. him around, I went to her and I was like, are you going to be okay if this happens? And she was like, that that's epic. You have to do that. And I was like, all right. So what I did is I had it in my jacket pocket and, you know, we walk up the aisle. I got the bridesmaid with me and I go up to my spot and it runs in the spot and it's the music and everyone's standing in their rows, you know, like yep. they do. And then everyone turned toward the pastor to do the ceremony. And then at the predetermined time, because I conspired with the other groomsmen and we decided it was going to happen. I pulled the thing out of my jacket subtly. So the audience is to my left and I hand this bottle to the groomsman in front of me. He keeps it on his right to the next guy, to the next guy. And then when uh, to the best man and when Billy Bob turned around to get the rings, he had the ice in his face. That's pretty epic. I will yeah. say that's yeah. amazing. Did he get down on one knee and slam it? He did it right there yes. on the altar. Awesome. Oh, yeah. That's a pretty good story. So, yeah. I'm sure that somebody's got on video. I was, was going to say, I hope somebody has that on video. Yeah. And, a, uh, and somebody that might be a novice to all that you're saying would like to know maybe how big is that bottle? A regular bottle. It's just a 12 ounce bottle. Like that. Yeah. 12 ounce. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's just like a bottle of beer, but yeah, I will say slamming it is not, I mean, it doesn't really taste like it. It's great. like all sugar and malt. Yeah. Oh. It's it's pretty hardcore. But I will say also when there are times when at We Fest when you've been drinking all day for three days straight and you feel like crap, like all right, I'm just gonna ice myself. You slam one of those and go take a nap. Come back from no, the dead a little no, bit. No, then you feel good. You're like, all right, now I'm ready. <laughs> now I'm ready to go for the rest of the <laughs> afternoon. And this is at one, you know, like one p.m. <laughs> Well, for those of you that don't drink, yeah, <laughs> you're learning why you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a fun game, though. It is a fun game, especially when you get people in like creative ways. Yeah, it's super cool. Which, like I said, when Abby got me, so so I got her a couple of years ago the same way at um. It was at the West End, whatever that that bar is that has a hundred beers on tap. I can't. Oh, right. What it's called? Yeah, but, I can't um, think of it. Uh, I got her there and she was really mad at me. I go, Abby, you know the rules. Mm-hmm. And I made her get down on one knee and slam it there. So she's uh, just paying me back for, for getting her before. Yeah. You know what they say about payback. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so Midwest Country Music Organization. So yep. you get this thing, you're, you're, you're doing events. And one of the things that I was going to ask you about is I know that you've expanded beyond just the award show yep. and, you know, the sort of like forums and, and the community that's online. But there's other things that are happening, like almost weekly, right? Well, and and that's or so, pre-COVID, obviously. Yeah, and the the organization was never founded to put on events, right? That was never that was never our intent, never other than the award show. We want to do that to give artists uh, kind of a platform to be shown out to maybe an audience that would not they would not normally reach. It's right? it designed to be in digital. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and so we we started out with um we call them writers rounds now, but it was just uh I, I can't remember I think we call it like Midwest Country Nights or something like that. Yep, where yep. um where that started where we just we it was put, like back to your barbecue kind of thing, right? Well the first ones were at the poorhouse. Okay. And so because Allie worked there, so she had the the hookup there and again got got musicians a good stage there, but then it that's where it kind of evolved into the um the acoustic stuff and it's more of right you know playing your own music right the the stuff that you wrote yeah not not playing covers right so originals any, yeah, exposing playing, the audience your originals. originals yep yep um and so we we were doing that i want to say two or three nights a week at different bars and restaurants throughout the twin cities and we had expanded it over into wisconsin and i believe we were expanding it down into iowa as oh, well cool um and again it's not the minnesota country music organization midwest. it's the midwest country music organization that's what we want to make sure that it's not just it's not just minnesota folks obviously did i say minnesota again i know no 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 you said okay. you said midwest um but i just want to say that for so so everybody knows cuz mm-hmm. obviously we had to start in minnesota and that's where mm-hmm. our biggest um like membership group is because well, on the board that, that's yeah that's we're here we live here right um but it's it's definitely not just a, a minnesota thing it, it's for midwest so we're we and after the award show last year we had um on the calendar we were going down to iowa to kick some things off and then COVID hit and so we were right at the cusp of breaking into you know totally big into, into, an, into another market 
Um, and then we were going to go to South Dakota as well. And yeah. we have some connections up in North Dakota. Um, you know, obviously we have connections already in Wisconsin that was already yeah. in play, but um, that, that last award show was really about to launch us into that next level. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the rug got pulled out from everybody, not just Everyone, us, yeah. but artists, restaurants, you know, small businesses, everything like that, which, which really sucks for everybody. Um, I mean, I think it was the right thing to do at, you know, at the time to um, the, the two weeks to flatten the curve type of thing. I think it's got a little out of control lately, the last handful of months, but um, yeah, you know, there's, I, there are definitely, it, it's safe to go out now with precaution. Yep. Right. Um, so I think things could be open back up, but um, you know, that, that it's every individual's opinion on, on what's safe and what isn't, but uh, yeah. And it's important that, you know, that we illustrate that everyone has the right to make those decisions yeah, for themselves. Yeah, so yep. our, you know, what you're talking about yep. is more just about having the opportunity for those folks that make a different decision. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, again, I don't, I don't really want to go into this too deeply, but telling everybody to stay home is different than allowing people the choice to stay home or go out if they want. Exactly. Right? And, right. And, you can do that, and you can do that safely. I mean, I've been back in the office since June 15th. Right. And so um, there's, there's safe ways to do it. Uh, yep. I work for a healthcare company. So yep. we obviously are, we wouldn't be sending people back into the office if it, if it wasn't safe. How many right? days this in 2020 was Walmart closed? Yeah. Zero. Right. So, um, and it can be done. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what we're, what we're doing now though, is trying to, um, we dropped our, our membership fees down to $1 for, amazing. for 2021 or for 2020 and for 2021. So we give, we're giving everybody, uh, you know, free membership because struggling musicians, we don't want to take right. money from people that sure uh, that can't afford it. And th that's not the point of the organization isn't to run on membership dues anyway. Right. Right. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody you're not going to get rich that way right yeah exactly <laughs> and and we want we want to make sure that somebody didn't lose the opportunity because they couldn't afford the membership yeah, right yeah especially now with with everything that's going on so we want to give everybody the best chance possible um to prepare themselves for the the reopening or relaunching um you know free america whatever you want to call it yeah um i took that word from from matt gronke that's what he always says free america uh but He's a good dude. Now we're we're lining up the um, the writers rounds to see when we can get those started and when some of the venues will allow uh, you know some artists to to come in and play again only two to three artists not not full band or anything like that but um, just to kind of ease back into it and then we're trying to figure out hopefully we can have the award show back again next year and at at that point we'll include the twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one music because you know not a lot of stuff happened in in 2020 and yeah it's not looking like 2021 is going to be great either at least not the first half yeah for for a lot of folks so um we're hoping we can get back into it though that was a a, a topic of discussion tk i'm sure you're running in this too as you talk to different guests about you know future podcasts and stuff is just that question of when are they going to get to get out, uh, get to get out and perform again and, and be exposed to their fans again outside of, I mean, there's been a lot of creativity with folks doing the online concerts yeah. where they can still take tips and stuff that way. That's pretty cool. And it start. did you, I do have a question when you're done. Yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say uh, the online stuff started out really, really big back in March and April. Right. But mm -hmm. I think after a couple months of that, people just got, it, it, worn out from from that and i mean it's just it's been a it's taxing tough. time for everybody yeah right and so the online stuff is yeah. tough and it, yeah. it, it kind of lost its luster if you will the first the first couple weeks couple months were good um but then it's it's kind of um tapered off since then so when you're doing then, video chats and you've got a dozen people on there and it's tough the technology just isn't advanced enough because yeah. if one person coughs it goes to them, it shows to them right. and, and there's that slight they delay. get the green yeah. border right yeah. they get yeah. that slight delay and uh it's just so tough to communicate my wife is a school teacher and she has to deal with that all the time uh mentoring at the, my local church and trying to mentor kids yep. in high school it's just like yeah it's tough it, tough tough it's not the same as in person the question i have is what criteria or what is some of the criteria these bands have to achieve to uh win an award at your award show so that's that's a great question um we modeled it 
after as much after the um the bigger entity as, as possible right mm-hmm. so we we started out with any you can't nominate yourself but anybody can nominate you so it could be a fan uh fellow fan. fellow musician anything can can um can nominate you we would then tally all the nominations from everybody and then as as a board have a discussion um on who we thought was the best fit for each category mm-hmm. right and then once we had that narrowed down to to four or five people so this was year one then we had all of the the musicians all the members got to vote for each category right so as a board we had no deciding factor in the winner at all right well tell us so what were some of the categories so we had entertainer of the year mm-hmm. um male vocalist female oh, yeah, vocalist similar i yep, see yep all sorts of things um, we had studio producer of the year uh, photographer of the year. Danny so, G. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You should be a member, and then you can can be on the uh, get an award. So if we were um, still doing the Rowdy Cowboy Show, would there have been a uh, slot for us? Yeah, there would have been. All right. I mean, I, well, I think so. I, there probably would have been a, a way to kind of fit us in there. Contributor. I, yeah, contributor. Contributor. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, like, they need an I, MC I, category. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> so you can, wink, so you, wink. So you can get. So you can get in there. Um, yeah, I pre- but- I get like six votes, and five of them will be my family. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Kyle will be yeah. six and seven. Right. There we go. Yeah. And and so last year we expanded. We did the same thing for the nomination part of it, or, or for the original nomination. But then we expanded it. We have an advisory board as well. With um, there's a there's a handful of industry folks. Um, and when I say industry, I mean radio sponsors, yeah. uh, music festivals, venues. Uh, um, all sorts of, of that stuff that that were involved, and we expanded the the final nomination nomination. You know, like bringing it down to the to the final four or five groups mm-hmm. out to the advisory board as well. Because um, now at that point we were big enough to involve more people, and then eventually what we want to get it to is that it's all member driven. Okay. All so members nominate, members vote, and then that that vote narrows it down to the to the four or five final um, candidates for each category. And then it's again, voted on by the members. So that's, that's kind of the end goal once we get to that. So point. did you say you just had your uh, award show last weekend? No, no, a, a year ago. A it year would ago. have been yep. this yep. weekend. Who was right. the, uh, who was the entertainer of the year? Or do you remember? Now you're putting me on the spot. It's been, Sorry. It's been, a, it's been a year. Um, I, I don't know, but Kyle can pull up the website. I, it, we have, <laughs> we have all of the, the winners on the on the we website. should give kyle something to do yeah <laughs> I, I honestly don't remember um it was it was a year ago and we usually have a good time at the award show but yeah it, a good time is had for sure yeah right yeah you've been to both of them right i didn't i didn't make last year's okay. um i'm trying you to were remember. involved in the first one i was yeah, yeah. i was that. like the red carpet announcer yeah so I like you called. had a good time at that one, right? I did, yeah. yeah. That was a pretty good time. It, there was a, a little bit of an audio mishap and that they didn't have a wireless for me. Even though I brought a wireless, they didn't have a channel for it. And so they had to set me up on a hardwired mic behind the stage. So I was like I remember that announcing to the red carpet from behind the curtain, which is yeah. kind of hilarious when you think about it. Right. Pay no attention. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it that was, you know, some of the growing pains of the first year, right? Yeah. That we, right. That we just didn't know. And oh, it's fine. And, and then you last, roll with it. Last year. You know, we we improved some stuff, and we were set. I mean, last year's show was was really really good. Um, Allie was a producer; she did a phenomenal job on that. Um, and we were set to ramp it up even further this year. We're supposed to be tomorrow. Was supposed to be the oh, it's show. supposed to be tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Um, but, virus. but yeah, yeah. Then everything kind of took a turn, but that's all right. Yeah, uh, got something. The winners for because uh, it goes by those individuals for 2019. So the 2000 20 award ceremony is for those in 2019. Yep. The entertainer of the year was the Plot Hounds. Okay. Oh, cool. Oh. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, guys, as much fun as this has been, I think we got to bring this plane in for a landing. You know, this has been fun. This is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is our inaugural our inaugural show. And uh, I've sure enjoyed having you here, Ryan, listening to your stories and uh, 
admiring your boots and <laughs> when, when i come back i'll uh i'll, I'll get redemption yeah, I was gonna on that say, we, i feel like we the, the new balance back, shoes are i don't know this, the show is called boots and back straps i don't know i got a pair <laughs> of boots only, on. only one person is wearing <laughs> <laughs> like oversight oops in my yeah. defense i was leaving the house half awake this morning to the gym. <laughs> anyway so uh uh but no we we barely scratched the surface yeah. ryan on like all the different stuff that we can get into with you and so we hope that you will come back to do yeah i'd love to thank thank you very much you bet uh, for the hospitality and for having me on your your first show uh it's a it's an honor to be asked so, so i feel I right at home it. doing this because you know all my life because it is your house whatever yeah <laughs> That's true. Uh, but we always got the drink when we worked. We were one of the very few people. Except to drink. Except for the That's people who work at the post drink. office. You know, we got the <laughs> we got the drink while we worked, and it's kind of oh. fun sipping on some good Jack Daniels while we're uh, sharing stories and uh, yeah. talking country music and talking yep. talking hunting. Wow. So this Ryan, great. Yeah, Ryan. Real quick before we uh, let you get out of here, yeah. where can people find you? Um. Well, a couple couple places uh, at the bar <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm getting right near you. <laughs> not right now um so i i own a, a website called minnesotacountry.com um mm-hmm. that's one of the the local websites here uh i have plans to i'm, I'm starting a, a nationwide version um, okay which is it's called the country compass um and I, I need to kick that off but i i've worked to do there so um i have that i have uh a website called drinks and gear which i sell uh Coors Latte, Bud Latte, um, Miller Latte, th- those types of hats. Uh, and then just Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Ryan Pilgrim is, I was very original with my handle on uh, something to, something funny to choose. But That's yeah, your brand, Ryan, man, Ryan Pilgrim. Yeah, that's exactly. Your brand. Like everyone knows you, yeah. Ryan Pilgrim. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so yeah that's, uh, that, that's where I'm at. Okay, cool. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for our first episode yeah. of Boots and Backstraps. And uh, as Ryan has already pointed out, you can actually catch our podcast on Facebook and uh, Google Play and on um, all the uh, Apple podcasts, all the like audio and video platforms, YouTube, Facebook, YouTube, yeah, you'll Spotify, Apple, Google, all the things. Yeah, Danny's nice. all over it. So you'll you'll see us on all of that stuff. And uh, and you can also, if you have a question for us or even for our guests, you can send an email to bootsandbackstraps at gmail.com. And uh, we'll even uh, go through those and potentially feature a question or two on these weekly podcasts. So next week, very cool. next week, we're going to uh, be joined by uh, Heidi. Heidi, yeah, Heidi Owens. Heidi Owens from Hitchville. Long, long time friend of mine. Used to work with Heidi before she started singing. Uh, maybe we'll get her to bring some of the, you know, she has a couple of CDs of her own. Okay. You know, she started singing with Boogie Wonderland and. She's been singing for years. We've had her at the Wee Fest at least a half a dozen times. Yeah. Her and uh Matt her and Matt Hitchville. Hitchville, yeah. God, they they just their harmonies are wonderful. I love listening. Both incredible to them. singers. Mm-hmm. You bet. Heidi's gonna be with us and we'll have a lot of fun with her. As a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, uh for the next few weeks, well, I think every week, we're gonna have some of the most colorful country music people and the uh, hunting people. You're gonna enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed our first podcast. A little sketchy here and there, but you know we'll get the hang of it. Maybe we'll have to drink more. I don't know. We'll we'll find the right. Not going to drink any less. That's for sure. I'm uh, sure happy that Ryan was here to share our first podcast. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Shane, you're a quarterback man. You know what you're doing. I I'm impressed. So, uh, say hey, everybody, whether you're belting out your favorite country song or you're out pursuing your favorite game, use that same passion that you do that with to pursue the Lord. He'll help you to shoot straight. We'll see you next week. Honey's on, looking for back straps, way deep in the woods, tracking in a swamp to a hay field under the harvest moon. When the tags are filled, it's time to switch up our boots. Head down to the honky tonk, get us a swing dance or two. We're talking about boots and back straps.